Welcome back. In a moment, we'll continue to look at the situation in Ethiopia. But first, here are some other stories to keep an eye on. Chief executives from some of South Korea's largest companies have appeared in court to answer questions as part of an alleged corruption scandal surrounding the country's president. Samsung, Hyundai and six other firms have admitted giving millions of dollars to funds associated with President Park Geun-hye, but deny any wrongdoing. Severe floods have hit the Thai island of Koh Samui. The island is a popular tourist hotspot and the rising water levels have left many visitors stranded. And people across India are in mourning after the death of a popular politician. Jayaram Jayalalitha was a former film star and died at the age of 68. She was immensely popular despite allegations of corruption which saw her jailed twice. Let's return now to our discussion of the situation in Ethiopia. Before the break, we heard from the country's ambassador to the UK. Now we're joined by Jordan Anderson, an analyst and Africa specialist from the think tank IHS. Uh, Jordan, the ambassador was being diplomatic, saying everything was going pretty well and the universities are full. But actually, it's a bit difficult over there right now, isn't it? The situation is complicated. What we've seen since the, really since April of 2014 is we've seen a growing protest movement which started out being concentrated in the Oromia region, the home of the Oromo people, and which in July of this year spread also into the neighboring Amhara region. Now between those two, those are the most populous regions of the country. So this is really a, a movement that has spread and which the government is having to take very seriously. How can they ignore the will of so many people? What the government will claim is that they are listening to the people and that as a consequence the government is, for example, going to introduce political reforms. Currently, the opposition parties hold no seats at all in the Ethiopian parliament. The government has claimed it's going to bring in changes in the near future, it's unclear when, that would allow some more representation of these parties. Again, it's not clear exactly what these changes would be either. But the government in many ways is treating this as a security problem. They claim that there are outside groups and inside groups that are attempting to destabilize the country. They say some are aligned to terrorists, some are aligned to secessionists. And as a consequence, the government instituted a state of emergency in October. This has had a no numerous provisions, one of which is the shutting down of a lot of internet services, which mm. prevent contact between the diaspora and the population inside the country, and has had over 11,000 arrests, though maybe 2,000 of those have been released since then. And so indeed some deaths, haven't they? There have been a number of deaths, and this is 500 a... 500 is one figure I've seen quoted. Do you believe that one? It, the number is likely to be higher simply because that is quite an old figure and it hasn't been updated for some time, so you'll have heard that earlier on this year in news reports. And it's quite difficult to update that figure accurately because of a lack of independent access to verify what happens in certain circumstances. So for example, at the Eritrea religious festival that we saw in October, we, the government claims there were 50 deaths after a stampede following a confrontation between the security forces and the protesters who were there. A certain members of the opposition in the protest movement claims that upwards of 600 people died in that. And it's very, very hard to verify and put those numbers together. If up over 600 people died, that would more than double the figure that we've been using already. What are these external factors? Um, you say the diaspora, uh, mm. Ethiopians who no, actually long, no longer live in the country. But the accusation, isn't it, from a slightly paranoid government that people outside the country are pulling levers, maybe funding, maybe supplying arms. Um, to the people in the country. What's the truth of that? There is a relationship between domestic protesters and individuals who are in the diaspora. So, for example, in the Ethiopian American community, you have a large number of Oromifo, or Romo language media, that broadcast and try to put their message into Ethiopia and, for example, try to coordinate protests. There was a big right. push to have a large why protest. Why some TV channels were shut down. Exactly, in, on the 6th of August. And that's part of why the government says there is this relationship with outside forces, which they claim are linked to terrorist and secessionist groups. The government has also claimed that there are groups operating in neighboring countries, but which they've taken a slightly measured tone on. They've said, for example, there are groups operating in Eritrea, but which aren't necessarily operating with the knowledge or the consent of the government there, which is qu it's quite a measured or a diplomatic tone from the Ethiopian government's take. What could be, the next move seems to be, then we have a government that's very fearful of the future mm. because they seem to be lashing out at any kind of protest. And yet, with another voice, they're saying we will sort out a more democratic future, a more representative future, a future where perhaps a greater proportion of Ethiopians benefit from the country's economic success. So the Ethiopian government defines itself as, as a development, developmental state and very much sells itself on the image that it is bringing and is increasing 
the wealth and the average income of the average there Ethiopian, which there is a great deal of truth to, and there is a large amount of investment. The problem is that that investment isn't always popular in the places where it takes place. So, for example, part of why we've seen the protests targeting, for example, foreign-owned commercial farms, flower farms in Ethiopia, a certain number of other foreign investments, is because those investments have been put in place on land that was expropriated from locals. Now, the Ethiopian government has compensated them according to Ethiopian law, but often locals still feel that they are being left out of this progress. So when it comes time to protest, they demonstrate this by going in, for example, burning flower farms. And that's part of how they express their unhappiness, not just with the government, but with really the, the form of development that it's being taken in the country. It's are there not employment opportunities, prosperity opportunities coming into the country as well? There are, absolutely are. But as with any investment, some people will benefit, some people won't. Some the people who do not <laughs> benefit, of course, uh, absolutely. find the yeah. whole thing very unfair. Yes. It's obviously those who feel left out will then are uh, more susceptible to getting involved in that kind of a protest. Which, by the way, they wouldn't deem as being a violent protest. Especially in Aromia, there's a conception that property damage is, is a legitimate form of showing your discontent. As long as you're not injuring people, they wouldn't consider that to be violent. So that's an important threshold. The fact that we've seen foreign farms being burned, but they're not attacking foreigners or workers at those farms. Without wanting to be too melodramatic, mm. is it sustainable, the status quo, with a growing resentment in this, what, 65, 70% of the, uh, of the country's population unhappy with the government. A government ruled by, well, I mean, every country has a ruling elite, I suppose we can say, but it certainly was a, dis a disconnect between that body and the ruling elite. It would appear on the face of it as a, as a sort of theoretical looking at it from a pl political standpoint, unsustainable. There are several layers, and this is, this is part of why even why the Ethiopian government says there have to be reforms to it. The Ethiopian governing coalition is composed of four constituent parties, each of which is based on, in one of the larger regions, each of which, well, three of which, in theory, are, are based on the ethnic groupings in the country. It's this idea of ethnic federalism. Yeah. And part of the problem is that even at that local level, a lot, no, large number of the protests in the Oromia and the Amhara region feel that even that regional government internally doesn't represent them, and they're venting a lot of anger at their own regional government as well. So it's not even just at the federal level that there are issues, but certainly at the regional one as well. But governments naturally never vote for their own demise, uh, do they, uh, or, or change? Who, if anyone's going to emerge and reach out and try and do some proper negotiations of what, what a new form of representation looks like? Well, the government is likely going to engage in consultations with this. They're unlikely to engage in consultations with the opposition groups that they say are aligned with secession or, or terrorists. And this has become increasingly difficult. For example, the head of the Aroma Federalist Congress was arrested earlier this week. This is a legal opposition party, but which, when it, uh, outside Ethiopia, it had a meeting at which there were representatives of organizations the Ethiopian government say are terrorists and secessionists. So he has now been arrested. So it's very hard to have that kind of consultation when even the legal parties are finding their leaders being arrested. It's one we'll have to watch and come back to, I'm sure. Thank you very much indeed, Jordan, for being with us. Now, we end our program with Insight Bite. This is just a little something that we feel you ought to know. Today, what every well-dressed astronaut will be wearing soon. Staff members and students at the Rhode Island School of Design have created a new adjustable spacesuit. The suit won't be keeping astronauts safe once they're off planet. Instead, this one is going to be used during training missions here on Earth. Apparently, current suits used in Mars simulation missions are uncomfortable with bad ventilation and the alternatives aren't realistic enough. It's hoped that by training in these new suits, astronauts will be better prepared for life on the red planet when that happens. And that's all for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was insight.